day. So welcome to everybody who just joined in. Welcome to the Pyramid Knowledge Conference. And we're going to get right into our next person, next individual that is going to be presenting today. And he is William Henry that a lot of you probably already are familiar with, done a lot of events on Portal to Ascension with William over the years, um, even more so in the last year, ever since the current world situation, we've picked up momentum in what William has been putting out on Portal to Ascension. And William is an author, investigative mythologist, regular guest presenter on Ancient Aliens, and star of the Arcanum TV. William is your guide into the transformative power of art and symbols of human ascension. He has been documenting humanity's awakening to the spiritual magnificence for over 20 years. Inspired by the great accomplishments of antiquity, William brings the evidence of our divinity by bringing to life the stories of ascension through art. He teaches the secrets of soul transfiguration or metamorphosis and connects people to, to one ac another across cultures, time, and space. He is the author of 16 books and numerous DVD programs on ancient mythology and neo-archaeology with a Stargate twist. By applying the latest theories in his science and consciousness to ancient myths of the gates of illuminated gods, including Sumerian, Egyptian, and Holy Grail gateway myths, he hopes to uncover the secrets of the guarded by such groups as the Illuminati. His latest book, Oracle of the Illuminati, states that we are on the verge of rediscovering the sacred science of creating peace on earth. And I also got to throw in there, and I think I've told you this, William, Let's go ahead and bring William on, is actually um, because of William is one of the reasons why I started doing Portal to Ascension in the first place. William Henry, Jordan Maxwell, and Nassim Harriman were the first conscious individuals I even came across back in 2001 that inspired me to do all of this. So I feel extremely honored just to be working alongside him, especially since his information was foundational in my own awakening. So let's go ahead and bring William on. You there, brother? There we go. You're muted. There we go. Hey, William. Hey, Neil. How are you doing? Doing good, man. How are you? I'm great. Hey, I didn't know that, that that I was an inspiration for you. That's it's really deeply touching. I'm so so happy to hear that. Definitely. I actually, um, you had stuff on Netflix in the beginning of Netflix coming out, and I ordered some DVDs from Netflix right when I was waking up. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's incredible. I mean, yeah. you just go about doing your work and you hope, you know, you, you put that pebble in the pond and the ripples go out and you just never know where they're going to lead. So exactly. Well, I appreciate you, brother. It's all yours. Thank you so much. And so glad to be here today. It's going to be a fun hour or so together. We're going to be talking about uh, the pyramids and the light of Atlantis. Uh, this is a talk that I normally uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. I only uh, get to give typically when uh, we're on our one of our Egypt tours. I've been to Egypt 23 times, taking groups. Started taking groups in the early 2000s, and never ever uh, ever do not approach these these magnificent pyramids without the deepest gratitude in my heart and and and, and thankfulness to be able to actually stand in front of them. In fact, when we conclude our tours in Egypt, we we conclude the tours between the paws of the Sphinx after having gone inside the pyramid. And I always uh, say goodbye to the pyramid and Sphinx and I always ask the same thing, please, please let me come back. Um, so it's, it's part of my life and I know it's an important part of your life too. And I hope to provide today, maybe some, uh, a little bit of a twist perhaps into some of your thinking about the connection between Atlantis and the pyramids. Our subject matter to, to begin with is gonna be Plato and his story of Atlantis, Manly P. Hall, the great mythographer and, and historiographer from the early 20th century, master of the occult symbols and uh, ancient lore, said that Plato was initiated in the mysteries at the age of 49. And he claimed that this was a pyramid-based initiation. And ever since I heard that, I always wondered, well, what, what did Plato learn in Egypt and what was the role of what he learned there in the development of his story about Atlantis. This is Plato's, uh, or excuse me, this is Plato in the center of the painting here. It's Raphael's School of Athens. It, it hangs in the Vatican. And in the center, we see Plato, he's uh, the one pointing upward and right beside him pointing towards you is his student Aristotle. And this is uh, an important painting for Atlantis researchers because Plato is portrayed holding a copy of his book, The Timaeus, 
which is, is one of the books in which he originally told the story of Atlantis, the Timaeus and, 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 and Critias. The story comes from those texts, which were written in the fourth century BC, fourth to early fifth century or late fifth century. Uh, Plato tells us that this story took place 9,000 years before his time. So we're talking about somewhere between 9,000 BC and, and, and 10,000 BC is when Plato is pointing us to is, is the time when the story of Atlantis took place, which is very important because now we know that was that corresponds precisely with what science calls the end of the Younger Dryas or the end of the last ice age. And many believe that this is the biblical flood, the, the flood of Noah. In his stories, Plato tells how his cousin Solon had been to Egypt where priests had told him the story of Atlantis, which was written on the pillars of a particular temple. They don't identify that temple in the story. However, in my research, beginning in the early 2000s and culminating with my 2006 book, Star Walkers and the Dimension of the Blessed, I decoded the ancient Egyptian uh, creation text at the Temple of Porus at Edfu and readily recognized based on the translations that were, were done by scholars at the University of Manchester, e, Dr. E. Raymond in particular, um, that these texts tell very clearly the story of Atlantis. This comparison is often made now, but back in 2006, when I first made this observation, it was brand new. It was, it was my original work. And in fact, it caught the attention of National Geographic. And they actually went to Egypt with me in, in 2006 to debunk this, this, this story, this possibility that the Temple of Horus at Edfu was the Is actual source material for Atlantis. Because everybody knows, of course, the story of Atlantis isn't true. And Nat Geo's perspective in this episode was not to, to really deeply look into the possible origins of the story of Atlantis, but rather to, to put the, the typical debunking on it to say, oh, this is, don't, don't pay any attention to the Atlantis story. Anybody talking about Atlantis is a racist. That, that's what a lot of the woke claim now because enfolded within the story of Atlantis is supposed to be, and I certainly don't agree with this and do not promote this idea that the Atlanteans were Caucasian and somehow some kind of a super white race, advanced white race with all this technology and they gave it to dumb Egyptian people. I, I don't ever, ever suggest that. That is certainly not part of my, my take on Atlantis, but unfortunately the, the woke want to see racism in everything. And it's just something that we have to deal with in this area of alternative history as well, because they, they want to label people such as me in TV shows like Ancient Aliens as, as racist, because we believe that the ancients somehow interacted with advanced beings from previous lost civilizations or perhaps even extraterrestrial civilizations. So there's no racism intended here. We're looking at an ancient story and asking the question, is it possible that the Temple of Horus at Edfu is the source for Plato's story. Now, what Nat Geo did is they, they completely discounted my, my connection here by saying this. Well, Will, what William Henry doesn't seem to realize is that the, the Temple of Horus at Edfu wasn't built by, by the, the Ptolemies until the early 300s BC, if not perhaps later. So how could Plato have gotten the story from the Temple of Horus at Edfu? Well, that, that makes a lot of sense, right? It's kind of like saying, you know, you go to a, a hotel room and there's a Bible in the drawer sometimes, maybe not so much anymore, but uh, you can still go to hotels and there's a Bible in the drawer. And it's kind of like saying, oh, well, these stories, the, these, this Bible was, was published in 2020. Therefore, the stories in the temple or in this book could not possibly have been told or uh, happened any earlier than 2020. It's the same kind of logic just because the story is published or printed on the walls of the Temple of Horus in the 300s does not mean that Plato could not have known the story. Part of the reason why I still think it could be Edfu is because according to legends etched onto this book in stone, it replaced an older structure designed in accordance with the divine plan that dropped down from heaven to earth. So there was a previous temple there. And perhaps there was a pillar or a column that preserved the story of Atlantis. And then when the temple was rebuilt, they retold or republished the story of Atlantis on the temple walls. Either way, this story, the Edfu creation texts, tell of a bird-like tribe of beings, B 
beings of light who came to earth and as the way I described it, laid an egg that became the original island civilization that suffered a cataclysm. They called it the island of the egg. And as we briefly look at this story, we're gonna find that it precisely corresponds beat for beat with Plato's story of Atlantis. So close is it that I propose that this is in fact the source for, for Plato's Atlantis story. Here we read about the origin of a primeval resting place of the falcon, a bird-headed being, and life in a primeval domain of the falcon. These texts relate a tradition that says the original spot of creation, the original spot of creation, according to the Egyptians, the island of creation or the island of the egg, as it was called, was a field of reeds where divine beings resembling falcons came to earth. Writing in her book, The Mythical Origin of the Egyptian Temple, Eve Raymond, the professor at Manchester University I referenced a moment ago, says that these mysterious texts contain cosmological records that begin with a primeval island where the gods or divine beings were believed to have lived first. Among the titles included in the Edfu collection are the specification of the mounds of the early primeval age, the sacred book of the early primeval age of the gods, and the offering of the lotus. According to Egyptian cos cosmology, all creation began with the emergence of a sacred island out of the primordial or primeval waters of noon. The island of the egg, as it was called, was surrounded by the primeval water. Now, you can interpret this as a celestial island. However, as Thoth is considered to be one of the potential authors of this text, his adage, as above, so below, must be factored in. And what this means is that there could be a sacred island in the heavens, just as there's this sacred island on earth. At, and that the, the, the Edfu text then continued to tell us that this island was at the edge of a lake called the Field of Reeds, and there was a sacred domain referred to as the homeland. And throughout these Edfu texts, we learn about the ancestors, the original divine dwellers of this Field of Reeds. So the picture that's being told or th that is developing is of these divine beings, some with falcon heads, perhaps some without, came from a divine island, a, perhaps a celestial place, to earth and founded the original island civilization on earth. And these ancestors, as they're described in the text, were responsible for bringing into existence all that exists on earth. The island of the egg that they created was thought of as the nucleus, the egg from which all creation on earth grew, and a lotus emitted radiance from this place. Now, this is very interesting to us because many in the ancient astronaut field or bands of ancient aliens are familiar with what is referred to and shown here as the Dendera light bulb. Eric von Doniken, 1968, identifies this lotus bl blossoming as what we today would refer to as an incandescent light bulb. And that's true. On one level of interpretation, that is what that, that portrays. It, also, it is also true, it, it also portrays a plasma tube, which is the, the forerunner of today's cathode ray tube or your computer screen, TV screen. And it does appear to me that these are plasma beings that are holding these plasma tubes. But it's also true that they, the, the depiction of this moment of creation, which is what Egyptologists would tell you this actually portrays, the moment of creation, this imagery, when superimposed over Nat National Geographic's depiction of the Big Bang, that moment of creation when all burst out of a tiny dot of light and continues to expand throughout the universe, you superimpose that over the Dendera light bulb or plasma tube and moment of creation, and it's a perfect match. So it, it suggests that it's possible that the ancient Egyptians must have known a lot more about the moment of creation and about the origins of humanity on earth than perhaps we're giving them credit for. And this is something I'm certainly interested in is the expansive consciousness that was possessed by the ancient Egyptians, far from the critique of the woke uh, critics and skeptics that say the ancient, we're, we're trying to portray the ancient Egyptians as backward and, and technologically illiterate. Far from that. It's, in fact, it's the exact opposite, but they just can't wake up and, and listen to what we're actually saying here. The Egyptians said that a mound 
emerged from these primordial waters and became the resting place of the creator of the world. It was on a high hill that a group of nameless deities who existed before the origin of the world came into manifestation. Now, this is profound because what the ancient Egyptians are saying, and if this is the island of Atlantis we're talking about, as I propose it is, then what we're asked to consider here is that Atlantis was founded by these primordial light beings, a group of nameless deities who existed before the origin of the world and founded the civilization of Atlantis. And what we deduce from this astounding mythology is the idea that the field of reeds, where they originally located this island and the primordial mound, was located in a primeval island where the world began and where the formless creator entities, who were light beings, originally lived. In her analysis of the Edfu Genesis tale, Raymond proposes that there's clear evidence that during the final phase, or excuse me, the first phase of creation, the island of Earth was occupied by divine beings from the field of the blessed. And they teleported into the Earth plane. This is what these creation texts said. They emerged from a lotus, which is a way of saying that they were they manifested on the Earth plane. These are the original gods. These are the netter. These are the celestial beings or the heavenly beings. One of the key figures that we're going to talk about in our search is Ptah. He came from Sirius, according to the ancient Egyptians. He is the, the god uh, of technology who is responsible for fashioning the human body. And Dr. Raymond notes that these divine creator beings seem to have lived in the island of the egg in an insubstantial in form. This is exactly what we're told about Ptah, is that he emerged or manifested from out of the blue. In other words, he wasn't there, and then suddenly he just appears. He materialized, right? And so did the original divine beings who founded the island of the egg or Atlantis. These shapeless creative powers were described by the Egyptians as the most aged ones and the lords of light. They begat themselves, says Raymond, without father and mother, just like Melchizedek in the Old Testament. They manifested out of thin air. How did they do this? Well, I have an explanation for the nature of these beings. As, as we look in the detail here of Ptah, we see that he, he wears his feather resurrection garment or coat of many colors. He's got his skull cap on or the helmet of salvation, his resurrection stick his rainbow rings and his necklace of immortality, the rings of gold uh, at his wrist. And he stands on the stone of Mott, which signifies divine or cosmic truth. He is the God that fashioned our DNA. So we shouldn't be surprised that we see Ptah accompanied by or standing in front of a double helix. And this is part of the, the mission of the original creator gods, according to the Egyptians, is that they had a hand in fashioning the human body as well as founding the, the original earthly civilization, the island of the egg or Atlantis. The point I'm wishing to make here is that clearly we're being asked to believe that these first creator beings were immaculately conceived from out of the blue, just like Ptah. So they must be similar in nature to Ptah. These lords of light were regarded as self-created divine beings and are described as the primeval ones and they built the high hill that was the center of the island of the egg. Here we see Nefertari uh, from her tomb in the Valley of the Queens, and she's portrayed wearing her transparent linen garment. She's saying thank you to Ptah by offering him the Egyptian hieroglyph for new clothes. What she is saying to him is, Ptah, thank you. You fashioned human DNA. And in my interpretation of this, you fashioned human DNA to make our body a more conducive vehicle so that we could become more like the gods, that we ourselves would be capable of transmuting our physical flesh and blood bodies into light so that we can be like the original light beings that founded the island civilization. And so in this depiction here, again, from Nefertari's tomb, we see her saying, thank you to Ptah for enabling this to happen. He's standing with his resurrection stick in front of the multicolored stairway to heaven, 
as the tent pillar that he's in front of is known. And what I have done in my work is to say, well, okay, if Ptah is a light being, just like the original creator gods of ancient Egypt, can we match him up and match these creator beings, these light beings, with any other known types of light beings um, throughout the world? And the answer is, yes, we can. In, in my work, I link Ptah to Padma Sambhava, the Lord of Light, if you will, of Tibetan Buddhism, who taught the, the Tibetans how to accelerate the frequency of their earthly flesh to transmute it into celestial flesh, which is referred to as the rainbow light body. This practice is referred to as the great perfection. And what Padma Sambhava showed us was the way for humans to become like the gods. Like Ptah, his name is phonetically similar to Ptah, Padma, Ptah, similar names. They both are lotus born. In the, in the Tibetan story, Padmasambhava manifested on the earth plane through a lotus, just like Ptah. So this is where I, I source this connection between the two. Not only are their names phonetically similar, and not only are their stories similar in their mythology about their birth and their capabilities, but artistically, Padmasambhava and Ptah share extraordinary similarities. They both have a resurrection stick. They both are lords of light. They both manifest rainbow colored light around them as evidenced by Ptah's rainbow rings. And I think there's enough room to at least ask the question here, is it possible that not just Ptah, but also Padmasambhava are exemplars of what the ancient Egyptians were describing as the nature of the divine lords of light, the light beings that originally founded the island of the egg or even possibly Atlantis. Now, you've seen these types of beings before that the Egyptian creation texts are describing uh, and the Tibetans are describing. You've seen it in, in the Wizard of Oz when, when Dorothy goes into the dream and goes up into the vortex and finds herself in that otherworldly place, Oz, she encounters a, an advanced spiritual being that emerges or manifests out of nowhere. So you've seen the appearance of Glinda, the good witch. She is manifesting from a higher frequency realm into a, in phasing into a form in which she can be perceived by Dorothy. And what's so fascinating about this to me is that when you look at Glenda the Good Witch, she's got her resurrection stick, she's got her garment of light, she's got her crown on, she matches the symbolism of Padmasambhava. And not only the symbolism, but also what the Tibetans say these light beings can do. They can phase in between their earthly flesh and celestial flesh. It's a matter of tuning the frequency of the human body and ultimately dissolving our flesh and blood body into the rainbow light body. I believe that this is what the Egyptian creation texts are describing that the founders of Atlantis could do. These, these groups of beings who later took on the appearance of the bird-headed falcon beings had the ability as lords of light to phase into the earth plane, phase into physicality, interact with human beings, and then phase back into their higher frequency, purer or perfected light being status. Now, the Edfu texts tell us that when these lords of light came to earth, they brought technology with them, undoubtedly spiritually based technology. And they tell us that this island of the egg suffers a cataclysm. And before the cataclysm takes place, they were able to secrete away certain power tools they called relics in the text, which are stored within the mound or hill on the island of the egg. After the cataclysm, when the waters recede, they're able to reclaim these relics. In the story, the Edfu texts tell us that a cataclysm destroyed the island of the egg, and it was something specifically called the mysterious sound eye that emerged from the island that created the devastation. Dr. Raymond believed that the sound eye was the center of the light that illumines the island. At the center of the island is the high hill. 
So that means that this mysterious light emerged from a high hill on the island. And perhaps there was something that was stored within that high hill that produced this light. When the island fell into complete darkness and darkness fell on the sacred domain, the sacred domain was then destroyed. But after its death, there was a rebirth or a resurrection. A second generation of sages recovered the only relic to have survived the time of conflict, a single Jed pillar or Tet pillar that was located in the divine field, and they resurrected the homeland. And I believe that this relic they're describing is the Tet pillar, which is why you see it uh, in so many key places in Egyptian temples. So with that brief background, let's now come over and talk about Plato's story of Atlantis. In Plato's story, he tells us that when the gods divided up the world, the god Poseidon received Atlantis and promptly fell in love with a young Atlantean woman named Plato. To protect her, Plato, or Poseidon reshaped the land in alternating concentric circles of land and water, and he made the central island fertile and equipped it with hot and cold springs. And here, Poseidon and his human wife had five pairs of twins. These are the giants, the titans, as they're called. What's important for us to acknowledge is that mythologists for over a century have noted the correspondence between Poseidon, the Sumerian creator god Enki, and the Egyptian god of technology and creator god Ptah. They're all three thought to actually be the same figure. In Plato's story, he tells us that the Atlanteans were the offspring of a divine being, Poseidon, and an earthly female. What this means is that the, the Atlanteans were hybrid beings. And Plato emphasizes in his story that as long as the Atlanteans retained the divine blood of the ancestors, who again were presuming are these divine light beings that took on physicality, as, as long as the Atlanteans remained true to their ancestors, the divine element within them would be retained. In other words, they would stay connected to their original divine light being status. It's quite possible that what this saying is that as hybrids, they were equal parts flesh and equal parts light. Their literal divinity that the Atlanteans possessed gave them nobility of spirit, said Plato. Self their self-control and restraint was stronger than materialism, and it was stronger than their love of wealth. And as long as that stayed in place, everything was going to go fine with the Atlantean civilization. But when they started to tip too much into the materialistic uh, realm and started answering more to their flesh and blood selves rather than their light being selves, this is when the, the Atlanteans began to have problems. This is when, as they did in the story, start developing or focusing on the material self. This is when the divine portion within them began to fade away. And humanity, according to the story, then begins to lose touch with its original divine light being status. And this is uh, going to be uh, a, a story element that reappears later in the book of Genesis. In the esoteric interpretation of Jewish mysticism, we're told that Adam and Eve were originally beings of pure light and pure love. And when we succumb to the wisdom of the serpent and were evicted from Eden, this is when we got our coats of skin, our flesh and blood earth bodies. Before that, we were in our light being phase exactly like Plato is saying the Atlanteans could have been in their original uh, existence when they honored and continued to live through the divine light body of, of their creator beings. Again, in the story of Atlantis, we all know they fall just like in Genesis. Zeus, perceiving that an honorable race was in woeful plight and wanting to inflict punishment on them, that they might be uh, chastened and improved, called a meeting of the gods to address them. And on this note, initiating the overthrow of Atlantis and the destruction of the human race, the text of Critias breaks off in the middle of the sentence, and that is the end of the Atlantis story. Atlantis is perhaps part of an ongoing struggle, and one that we're in fact living today, to see a philosophical utopia 
take its place in the real world, a perfect or a just society, as it's called. Atlantis is also a warning about losing our righteousness and mixing our more mortal and immortal parts, mixing our moral with our immoral parts. It's all about living pure lives based on light, love, and righteousness, and locked onto and focused on developing our light body, according to Plato. So this brings up a, a very important question. Could the Atlanteans, who were the divine offspring of these original creator gods, which again, we're asking you to, to link them with the original creator gods in the Egyptian creation text at, at Edfu, could these have been perfect light beings in the sense that Tibetans think of the rainbow light body beings? Were these higher frequency beings that had the ability to phase into physicality and to ultimately uh, manifest themselves as physical beings and thereby intervene in human affairs by altering our DNA and also by assisting in the creation of uh, very important temple complexes, including the Great Pyramid. That is part of the question we want to uh, answer as we continue. And the way we're going to do that is by once again acknowledging that the biblical flood narrative discusses the evil of mankind that moved God to destroy the world, not Zeus. Uh, by way of a flood, just like happened with Atlantis, just like happened with the island of the egg in the Egyptian creation text. And we know of the, the, the biblical story of Noah, that he builds an ark, saves his family, saves two of every kind of animal, as well as uh, plant life as well. Question, could Noah have been an Atlantean? Well, the answer is affirmative if you're following the, the, the work of Edgar Cayce, who believed that there were two destructions of Atlantis. And in fact, that is another correspondence with the Edfu creation text, that the, the island is, is created, and then it's destroyed by a cataclysm, it's rebuilt, and it's probably then destroyed again before the time of Plato. And this is what Plato is actually describing. According to Cayce, the second destruction of Atlantis corresponds with the biblical story of the flood and the saving of Noah and his family. And in his readings, Casey came to the conclusion that Noah, in fact, was an Atlantean. Now, here's something very important. The book of Genesis says this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man. Just means he was righteous. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Well, wait a minute. The only other person in the Old Testament who walks with God is Enoch. And Enoch is a pre-flood sage, possibly an Atlantean, who walked with God and he was not, for God took him. And by this, we understand that Enoch ascended. So if Enoch is a perfect being and walked with God, and Noah is perfect and walked with God, did Noah ascend to in the pre-flood world? And what then exactly would be the mechanism for his ascension? In 3 Enoch, Metatron describes, the, or excuse me, the Rabbi Ishmael describes how Enoch lived before the great flood, the Atlantean civilization, some say, and was transubstantiated from mortal to angelic form. The book of Enoch picks up the, the story of the book of Genesis and says Enoch was actually transubstantiated or translated is another term from his earthly flesh into his celestial flesh. And in my research, what I'm asking you to, to, to do is to match Enoch sitting on the rainbow, as we see here, with Padmasambhava in his rainbow light body, in his perfect rainbow light body, and ask the question, was did in, did in fact uh, Enoch and Noah, by being called perfect beings, did they also attain their perfect light body? Is this in fact how they survived the flood? Now, with that basis in, in, in mind now, we want to go forward and connect the Great Pyramid to the story of these divine light beings, the rainbow light body beings. And that's what we're going to do now. Plato describes a sacred mountain at the center of Atlantis. Near the plain in the center, there was a hill low on all sides. 
Poseidon, in order to fortify the hill, broke it down all around and there placed alternatively greater and lesser, lesser walls of earth, sea, and water. Upon the hill, the royal palace and the fabulous temple of Poseidon, previously described, were built surrounded by three arranged walls. So this is Poseidon's hill. And on Poseidon's hill is Poseidon's temple. And around this artificial mountain, Poseidon's hill, there are two enclosure walls alternating with three moats. These represent respectively the three moats of sea between the two earth walls taken all around the hill of Poseidon. Now, what's interesting about this is that this, this is a description of the world mountain. Plato's hill, Poseidon's hill, the original mountain of Atlantis, even the Great Pyramid is referred to as the world mountain. And another name for the world mountain is Meru. And turning to Buddhist imagery, we find a remarkable image of Meru as we're looking at here. And you can see uh, the Buddha, or excuse me, Padmasambhava rather, emerging in the top in his rainbow light body. And at the base, can you see the concentric, uh, the concentric not rings, but the concentric rectangles, which could represent the pyramid or the original mound of creation, the world mountain. Either way, that is a main element of this image. And it looks as if Padmasambhava is emerging from the world mountain in his rainbow light body. There are many world mountains around the world that correspond with this three-tiered notion of Poseidon's hill as described by Plato. The ziggurat in Ur we just looked at, Bora Badur has the same thing. And it also has the concentric rings exactly as described by Plato. And then also this Khmer temple in Cambodia has the similar uh, three rings of, of portals going into a central ring. And then we also see the similar concept here at Teotihuacan near Mexico City. So all of these world mountains could conceivably interlock with the original world mountain, which would be the pyramid of Giza. Now, Meru, as the name of that world mountain, is very important because a phonetically similar word, <clears throat> excuse me, Mera, was the original ancient name of Egypt, Pata Mira, the land of Mira, which means beloved land. Literally, Ta Mary means the place of MR, and MR has been uh, interpreted as a canal or a waterway. So without the vowels, Meru becomes MR, and which is again corresponding with the ancient name of Egypt. Well, Mera or Mer, MR, is the original name for the Great Pyramid of Egypt, or is a term, an original term applied to the Great Pyramid of Egypt. So we have to be thinking about the world mountain when we're thinking about the Great Pyramid of Egypt. And as we're facing it, we are face to face with the ancient mysteries of the world mountain. And I believe possibly with the original primordial hill described in the Edfu creation text. No matter how many times Claire and I stand on this, uh, this spot here, which is referred to as the panoramic view of the pyramids, we're always filled with this sense of wonder. and you look at this and you think we could be on any planet. This, this could be Mars, uh, based on the recent imagery we've seen coming back from Mars. The, the surface of Mars looks very similar to this. And you think, what if there are these pyramids on other planets? And what if these divine creator beings that the Edfu creation texts tell of, again, possibly the source for Plato's Atlantis story, what if these are beings that go from planet to planet to planet to planet, building pyramid complexes, building original islands of the egg, these primordial hills? You, you get a tremendous sense of wonder when, when you're standing at this place and know that these buildings <clears throat> have been standing for at least 10,000 years, at least 10,000 years, maybe 50,000 years. Nobody knows for sure. They're certainly much older than traditional Egyptology would, uh, would accept. And you just have to stand in awe and ask, what, what was the original purpose of these buildings? There's mounting evidence, as I was saying, that around 10,000 years ago, a very advanced technological civilization had been destroyed by cataclysmic events. 
especially in the area of the Giza Plateau. They left some of the most mysterious constructions ever conceived. And it's incumbent upon us to follow the trail of these mysteries because ultimately, I believe they lead us back to those original divine light beings as recorded in the Edfu texts. They are the ones who brought the technology of resurrection to earth with them. And that became the basis for all the Egypt, ancient Egyptian religion, mythology, their stories. Everything is about resurrection and our ability to transmute ourselves into light and travel with the gods as celestial beings in the stars. All ancient Egyptian technology, everything that we're looking at, uh, be it the, the Dendera light bulb, the pyramids, the Tet pillars, the Osiris device, everything is based on the, the, the belief in human transformation into a star being as described not only in the Edfu creation text, but also in the pyramid texts, which functions as sort of the software for the hardware of the pyramid. So continuing now with our exploration of this MR symbolism, the hieroglyph of MR is a pyramid. And Egyptologist Mark Lehner stated that the ancient Egyptian or Kemeshian term, Kemet being an, the original name for Egypt, the original ancient Kemeshian term for pyramid was something he calls MR dot pyramid. MR dot pyramid. And Lehner bases this trans this on his translation of MR as instrument or place of ascension. Now, Mark Lehner is one of the most traditional Egyptologists and most often cited contemporary Egyptologists out there. He's as mainstream as they get. And here he is telling us that MR means instrument or place of ascension. And the hieroglyph for MR is a pyramid. That is giving us at least some sense that the pyramid has something to do with ascension. And the ascension that's referred to here is a metaphysical one because the software for the pyramid, the pyramid texts, speak of a metaphysical journey of the soul on its way through the duat to reach the afterlife. Everything that we see in ancient Egypt relates to this journey, including the pyramids. The pyramid texts were discovered in the late 19th century at Saqqara, or Stargate Saqqara, as I call it, when it was excavated by Gordon Maspero. And in one of the complex's nine pyramids, he discovered inscriptions known as, as the pyramid text. This is what's left of the pyramid of Unas. It's right next to the stairway to heaven or step pyramid at Saqqara, uh, just a few miles from the Giza Plateau. This is a tremendously important site and it's uh, in total, uh, um, not total disintegration, but it, it, the, the top of it is, is not much left as you can see. But the important business that goes on at this pyramid is actually 90 feet beneath it, where we find the tomb of King Unas, who, whose name uh, is given to the pyramid as well. And here we find the pyramid text etched on the walls of the tomb of Unas. They date to 2375 BC. They're considered the oldest religious text in existence. And they likely existed in oral form before this time. Now, what we're seeing here is the sarcophagus of Unas, and then you see the texts all around him. These are, are so important to us in the context of understanding the pyramid because they, they refer to its ultimate purpose. And the purpose of these texts is to assist the king in the process of his transformation into a divine being, providing knowledge and also magic power to the king in the afterlife. And what is so, so important about this is that according to one of the, the pyramid text interpreters, Faulkner, the pyramid text should be regarded as part of the ancient Egyptian star religion. I would augment that slightly to say this is part of the original star being religion, because these texts are all talking about star beings and human transformation into star beings. After texts describing the king's purification, he goes into the sky. The sun folk shall call out to you, for the imperishable star have raised you aloft. Ascend to the place where your father is, to the place where Jeb is, that he may give you that which is on the brow of Horus. Utterance 261, the king becomes a flash of lightning. 
Lightning is plasma. So this is saying the king is no longer in his earthly flesh. He has now become a plasma being, just like the beings that are holding up the dender, a light bulb, are plasma beings. Utterance 215, the king ascends to the skies as a star. Stars are also plasma. Our sun is plasma. So the king ascends to the skies as a plasma being. Utterance 216, the king joins the sun god, Re or Ra. Uh, we notice here the double helix hieroglyph. And again, I'm uh, putting this in here because I'm suggesting to you, at least based on my research, that Ptah is one of these creator beings tweaked our DNA so that we could more easily affect this transmutation into a plasma being. Utterance 267, a stairway to the sky is set up for me that I may ascend to the sky. The stairway to the sky is another term for the step pyramid at Saqqara, which is supposed to have been the, the, the forerunner to the Great Pyramid of Giza. But actually, the chronology is, is reversed. The Great Pyramid is the actual uh, prototype that all Egyptian pyramids are based on. The Great Pyramid came first. It is the stairway to the sky set up for me so that I may ascend to the sky as the pyramid as the, uh, as the Pharaoh, the king ascends. Utterance 272, the king demands admission to the beyond. O height which is not sharpened, portal of the abyss, I have come to you. Let this be opened to me. Utterance 305, the, cl the king climbs to the sky in a ladder. What we're going to see here is that we're now believing that the pyramid is that stairway to heaven. That is its function. It is the ladder to the sky. It is an instrument of ascension. It is also an instrument of transmutation. And the pyramid texts are telling us this quite, quite clearly. The gods who are in the sky are brought to you. The gods who are on earth assemble for you. They place their hands under you. They make a ladder for you so that you may ascend on it into the sky. The doors of the sky are thrown open to you. The doors of the starry firmament are thrown open for you. Imagine this is that just put the word great pyramid in here. They make a great pyramid for you that you may ascend onto it into the sky. The doors of the sky are thrown open from within the great pyramid. The doors of the starry firmament are thrown open for you from within the Great Pyramid. This is what we're asked to think about, it is that with the pyramid as an instrument of transmutation, it is a way that humans can more easily attain their divine light body, transmute their earthly flesh into celestial flesh, and join the gods in the sky. Uh, another uh, hieroglyph that's included among the pyramid texts is this thong glyph, as it's referred to. But this, this one is really interesting because if you turn the thong uh, slightly to, or turn it to the left, it, it looks exactly the way modern science portrays a wormhole or the ripping of a fabric, uh, a ripping of a hole in the fabric of space time. Laird Scranton noticed this book in his uh, books, Decoding the Secrets of the Dogon, where he compared Brian Greene, a, a noted contemporary mainstream physicist, drawing of the fabric of space-time tearing and a wormhole growing with the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph, the thong, which means to tear. So they, they're either tearing holes in the fabric of space-time with the Great Pyramid, or they're not. And personally, I believe that they are. And if the symbolism is matching up and the language of the, the text, the software that go with the pyramid are matching up, we have to at least be open to the possibility that this is what the Great Pyramid is. It is this transmutation machine. It is a device that can turn a human being into a, a divine light being and then open uh, the door in the sky or tear open a hole in the fabric of space time. That, that, that's what we're being asked to consider here. And that's what these pyramid texts are describing. And this is why I'm so enamored by uh, the, the pyramid of Unas and what we see here in his tomb. Now, I want to show you something that, that just blows my mind every time I, I think about it. Uh, and it has to do with the walls here. As you can see, the walls of, the, of Unas's uh, tomb have these geometric figures that here's the double axe, like you would see something like this in, in Crete and, and at the same time around 2300 BC. And you've got these squiggly lines that seem to indicate frequency or vibration. Um, it, it just like, it looks decorative, right? 
But now look what happens. Um, here we are uh, on the left. You see the the two, the uh, sarcophagus of Unas. Um, excuse me. On the left, you see the, the sarcophagus of Unas, and on the right, or, or excuse me, on the left, the left pointing arrow, you see the wall with those decorative figures on it. And now uh, the, the right hand arrow is pointing to the opposite wall, which has the same geometric figures. Okay. And so this is what it looks like when you're just standing there in the tomb. Then something absolutely extraordinary happens. I, I probably had been in this tomb, I, I don't know, I've been to Egypt 23 times, and I've probably been in this tomb at least 23 times. Uh, sometimes I've, we've gone back and, and revisited it. So it was probably the first 15 or so times that I went into this tomb, I never saw what I'm about to show you. And then I had my mind blown by uh, having to be there at the right place at the right time um, with a guy that was going to put on a show for us. So look what happens here. He pulls out his flashlight, dims the lights in the tomb, and look what happens to the wall. Look at that. Can you see the King Unas embedded in the wall? How in the world did they do this? How did they get this effect without, I mean, we have a flashlight here. Maybe they used a candle. I don't know. I, 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 I wish someone who's watching would be able to explain this to me, how they're able to create this incredible visual effect. In daylight, you don't see anything, but you, you open up your eyes with the right light and behind the veil, suddenly we see a king traversing through a portal. I mean, it's, it's just, does it give you chills just thinking about this and, and, and what, what this ultimately can mean that, that when we're in any tomb in Egypt, when we're in any temple in Egypt, there's what our, our eyes can see and then there's what we can see with the right light. There's two different stories going on here very clearly. And unless we have the light, we're not going to get the illumination. So I thought you'd enjoy that. And uh, I hope you can come to Egypt with me sometime and experience it in person because it is truly magical to, to, to experience that. Uh, returning to the, the pyramid texts themselves, utterance 305, the king climbs to the sky in a ladder. The king climbs to the sky in the Great Pyramid, the instrument of ascension, the instrument of transmutation. Now, on this subject of the pyramid text, November 2017, Nature published the results of the Scan Pyramids Project, which were led by two researchers, one French and one Japanese. And they found a huge void, at least 30 meters or 153 feet long within the Great Pyramid, the, the Pyramid of Cheops. What's its function, its contents, its destiny, origins? Nobody knows. And archaeologists are now on a hunt for answers. Enter Guilo Magli, who's an Italian astrophysicist and archaeoastronomer, director of the Department of Mathematics at the, and professor of archaeoastronomy at the Polytechnico in Milan. He writes that Cheops Pyramid, and here you can see in, in his illustration, riding along the Grand Gallery, as it's called, he's got that, uh, that uh, lengthy uh, illuminated space that indicates this new gallery or newly discovered gallery. Um, he writes about this gallery that Cheops Pyramid built around 2550 BC is one of the largest and most complex monuments in the history of architecture. Its internal rooms are accessible through narrow tunnels, one of which before arriving at the funerary chamber, funerary chamber widens and rises suddenly forming the so-called Great Gallery. The newly discovered room is over this gallery, but does not have a practical function of relieving weight from it because the roof of the gallery itself was already built with a corbelled technique for this very reason. So what, what does that mean? It means that there is a gallery, there is a room inside the Great Pyramid of unknown function and perhaps that has contents within it, important contents that could answer who built the pyramid and why. As a matter of fact, there you, you see the, uh, the, the gallery coming up from the base of the pyramid, and then you see the, the thicker gallery. That, that's, the grand, that's the grand gallery. That's the pathway going up into the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid, which is a 
cube-shaped room lined with, lined with granite. There is room in the pyramid for 47 rooms the size of the king's chamber. So what we're asked to consider here is that concealed within this building could be a number of repositories or, or rooms of unknown function and also unknown contents. So when we're standing in front of this building and looking, in, looking at it from this perspective, unless we're able to go in and explore, we have no idea, once again, what could potentially be hidden inside. We know of the king's chamber, we know of the queen's chamber, we know of the grand gallery, and now we know there's also this new, uh, newly discovered chamber riding along or hovering above the, the grand gallery. What else is in there? What else is in there? And is there in fact a secret chamber behind these chevrons as is believed? This is considered to be the original entrance to the Great Pyramid. Claire and I are here standing in that entrance and it, it was, it's a rare moment when you're able to get up to that level of the pyramid. Normally, uh, you're, you're not allowed to access this place. So it was a very special moment for us to be able to, to go up and, and, and stand at, in, uh, beneath these chevrons that mark the entrance. Uh, beneath the chevrons, can you see the, the double peaked mountain? The double peaked mountain, that is the Aket sign at the entrance to the Great Pyramid. The Aket sign, the double mountain sign that holds up the sun or the light of the world. According to Magley, he says, there is a possible interpretation which is in good agreement with what we know about the Egyptian funer funerary religion as witnessed in the pyramid texts. In these texts, it is said that the Pharaoh, before reaching the stars of the north, will have to pass the gates of the sky and sit on the throne of iron. What Magli is saying, and he, again, the Italian archaeoastronomer is saying, is that he believes that the iron throne of Osiris could be concealed within that newly discovered gallery. Now, I took these photos that you're seeing here uh, from a, on a sarcophagus in the uh, Egyptian Museum in Cairo, where we see some figures scaling a ladder to the sky or stairway, where they now stand before Osiris sitting on a throne. Is this the iron throne that Magli is referring to? It could be. I, I've uh, gone to great lengths to study the throne of Osiris and the throne of the other Egyptian gods, and I match it up with the Merkaba mysticism of the Jewish mystics. This happens to be a, the enthroned Osiris, or perhaps Ptah sitting on his throne in the uh, tomb of King Seti in the Valley of the Kings. It's strikingly similar to the throne where you see the elder races, the elder gods, the ancestors sitting upon a similar throne, also wearing a cloak or a garment of light, just like Osiris. But in my view, the, the, the throne of Osiris um, is described as iron, but it's also portrayed as a feathered throne, as you see here. It, it's portrayed as feathered because it flies. It's his ascension throne, just like the Merkaba is the chariot of the gods. Uh, so is the throne of Osiris. It's his feathered ascension throne. And just like I do with Ptah, I am also match the image of the resurrected Osiris with the Tibetan rainbow light body tradition. Now, the ancient Egyptians don't do this. The Tibetans do this. This is original to me. And I'm saying it's original to me so that you can follow the source of this. You can go back to the source, me, and now we can begin to work forward and, and find out, hey, is there indeed a connection between the divine light body of Osiris as a resurrected being, having gone through the, the process of transmutation, and the Tibetan rainbow light body? And as I'm saying, can we link these also with the divine creator beings that the Edfu creation texts are suggesting are the beings that originally built the Great Pyramid? Were they, was the Great Pyramid built by divine light beings, just like the Tibetan rainbow light body beings, just like the resurrection body of Osiris and also Ptah? The answer, I believe, is I think so. Yes, I think we, we have legitimate reason to, to ask that question and to follow it up. In the pyramid text, the king was said to be transformed into an ak, a shining one or a being of light. 
It doesn't give us any details, but I think we've just filled in the details of the nature of these shining ones or beings of light. They're radiant, luminous humanoid beings who have attained the next higher frequency state of being. And according to the pyramid text, these beings of light would rule in the Eastern Akhet, the mountain of light. The purpose of the ancient Egyptian temples was to assist in the transformation of humans into shining beings of light. Uh, that, that's the premise of our, our tours in, uh, of sacred Egypt. We're looking always for the resurrection and ascension texts that are encoded in these temples. What this means is that the Great Pyramid Ascension Device or instrument as it's referred to by Mark Lehner, the mountain of light could feature a transformation chamber. And if this mountain of light and the primordial hill mentioned in the Edfu creation text uh, are the same thing, and the Edfu creation texts are the source material for Atlantis, the story of Atlantis, then that's what was at the center of Atlantis, was this ascension instrument, this mountain of light, this hill of Poseidon or Plato's hill. And within it is a transformation chamber. Magli, the Italian archaeoastronomer hypothesizes that the throne would have been a wooden chair covered in sheets of iron. I'm not sure I agree with that. Of course, it would not be melted iron, but meteoric iron that has fallen from the sky and, uh, and, and again cited in the pyramid text. More, Magli believes the throne could sit at the upper end of the second gallery exactly underneath the pyramid's apex. So here's a, my photo looking up at this mountain of light at the apex. And what he's saying is that in alignment with that apex is this gallery riding along the grand gallery. And within it is the ascension throne of Osiris. Now, what if that is the case? What if that is the case? Now, according to present day Egyptology, the Great Pyramid was allegedly called Akhet Khufu and allegedly meant the horizon of Khufu. That's wrong because E.A. Wally Budge, the great Egyptologist of the British Museum notes in his Egyptian Hieroglyphic Dictionary that the title of the Great Pyramid was Aku or Akut meaning light. Akut also means beings of light or wise instructed folk. Hancock and Baval explain in their book, The Message of the Sphinx, that the hieroglyphs of Aku can also mean transfigured beings, shining ones, or shining beings. And here's the page from, the, from Budget's Hieroglyphic Dictionary. Akut means beings of light, wise instructed folk, the light god, the great light, the sun. In his hieroglyphic dictionary, Budge added the following definitions of Aku, meaning to be bright, to be excellent, to be wise or instructed. So he's both describing the beings that built the pyramid and the pyramid itself. They are wise, instructed folk. They are illuminated beings. They are bright beings. They are uh, excellent beings. They correspond, in my view, perfectly with what is described in the Edfu creation text as these divine lords of light who manifested on earth in a non-material form, meaning in a light being form, but then later took on physicality. Another quote unquote proof of this line of thinking or a, a thread that we can follow in this line of thinking comes from the Gnostic texts where the great pyramids are called the pillars of Seth. The pillars of Seth. Seth is the son, uh, one of the sons of Adam and Eve. It has been suggested that this is the, the son of Adam and Eve in the biblical, biblical tradition. And this is the Seth that is the ancestor of Noah. So this is Noah's predecessor, a son of Adam and Eve. In his Antiquities of the Jews, Josephus writes, now this Seth, when he was brought up and came to those years in which he could discern what was good, became a virtuous man, meaning a just man, a righteous man, perhaps even a perfect man. And as he was himself of an excellent character, so did he leave children behind him who imitated his virtues. So Seth is being described here effectively as an Atlantean. Remember, the Atlanteans 
were righteous beings, just in, in every way. All of these proved to be of good dispositions, say, says Josephus. They also inhabited the same country without dissension and in a happy condition. And then he goes on to say, excuse me, that Adam's prediction that the world would be destroyed at one time by the force of fire and at another time by the violence and quantity of water prompted Seth to make two pillars, one of brick and the other of stone. And they, ins they inscribed their discoveries on them both, that in case the pillar of brick should be destroyed by the flood, the pillar of stone might remain. So from this, many researchers have proposed that Seth was a pre-flood figure who was involved with the building of the Great Pyramid. The Valentinians and the Ophites regarded Seth as the first of the race of perfect ones. The Valentinians and Ophites were, were Gnostic scholars, second to fourth century AD, and they're aligned with our thinking. They're saying Seth, as a descendant of Adam and Eve and an ancestor of Noah, who was also perfect, was a perfect one. And that he, in fact, was part of this primordial race. And as a perfect one, he must also have been a being of light. Now, that means Seth was originally either a being of light or he knew how to transmute his imperfect flesh and blood body into a perfect light body. And this again corresponds with the, with the Egyptians. Dr. Charles Muses proposed the Egyptians had developed a technology in which tones, lights, and an as yet unidentified plant were used to open a rusty valve or trigger the production of large pulses of hormones, similar to the X disome produced by larval forms of insects, which allows the adult form to emerge. And in this way, they would allow the gestation or mutation of a non-molecular body, a new skin, a light body that would allow the survival of consciousness beyond physical death. This is the technology of human transformation into a celestial being as described in the pyramid text. So for what purpose were the pyramids built? How about human transformation into celestial beings? How about ascension? It's a central premise of this work that the Great Pyramid served a spiritual and religious purpose. How about it was an instrument of transmutation? The word pyramid means fire in the middle. What if it possessed a fire frequency or vibration, as Chris Dunn has suggested, it being a power plant, that was coupled with a uh, coupled oscillator or a vibrational transformer? What if the tone that the Egyptians used to transmute their bodies into light was produced by the pyramid. And what if we could reproduce that tone today? Back in 2007, 2008, I had a, a, a sound expert, Paul Yates on my tour. He said, the Great Pyramid is a vibrational transformer, taps the resonance of the planet, converts it into a vibrational energy, and then transfers this across the land. Alan Alford had picked up on this in his book, Pyramid of Secrets, saying that it broadcasted a single continuous note, or it might even have uh, produced a combination of notes. So what we're talking about here is that the ancient Egyptians possessed a technology given to them by the gods a, a, that could produce a tone, that could transform a human being through manifestation of vibrational and electromagnetic fields into a different type of being, a non-molecular being like the gods. What if it was the gods that, that taught us this originally? What if it's these divine light beings? The Great Pyramid was essentially a mound of creation. It was a cocoon in which the king underwent transformation or recreation into an eternal transfigured spirit called an ak or a shining one. Journeying into the sky, he was united with the ancient Egyptian gods and resurrected each morning. What if that resurrection took place within the king's chamber? What if there was a throne involved? And just imagine if the Great Pyramid did play a, an original tone or song of creation. Imagine what it would be like to stand on the limestone platform, the Giza Plateau, and bathe in this song as it fills the air. I can just about hear it now. And I remember one time Claire, my wife Claire was with us in the King's Chamber and she spontaneously started chanting with another guest. She was actually singing the song of the pyramid. 
And in conclusion, I just want to share that with you for a few moments and then uh, take a couple of questions. So thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. And let's uh, listen to Claire just for a moment with her great pyramid chant. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Once again, I, I hope you've enjoyed that. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to, to take those now in the few moments that I have remaining. Hi, William. Wow. Amazing. I do. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> um, do you think that the, the bird-headed beings are the, what Corey Good's talking about, the blue sphere beings or the, and the blue, the blue avians? You know, I don't know. Um, I did an interview with Corey Good on Gaia. He, he didn't seem to know anything about them. Um, I presented some of this material to him and he was shocked that they even existed and that I knew anything about the blue avians from an ancient historical perspective. Mm -hmm. In fact, our one episode turned into three because I had so much material I had collected over the past 20 years about those beings. And, and Corey was just like, wow. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. He was dumbstruck. I mean, he was absolutely dumbstruck. So based on his response and his reaction, I, I, I can't say that they're the same because Corey, he was the expert on them and he knew nothing about them. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I find it interesting though. Like, I mean, it seems like it very well could be. And I love your correspondence between Padma Sambhava and these others because it sort of starts connecting the dots about the planetary civilization. Yeah, absolutely. Because we know that the, the rainbow light body teaching is taught in 13 star systems, including our own. So what this means is that this teaching isn't Egyptian. It's not Atlantean. It's not Christian or Tibetan. It, 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 it's cosmic. Uh -huh. And his partner, uh, Mandarava, was one of the beings who also achieved light body and helped crores of beings also achieve light body. So it's a wonderful thing to look up and study and put these pieces together. Exactly. And, and their terma, their hidden treasures are hidden in stones. And I don't know, that's why I encourage people to touch the stones of the pyramid, because I think it's still, they still vibrate with that original tone of creation. And just by, uh, by touching them, you, 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 you have access to it. Wouldn't the connection also be with the, the light body, the Merkaba is the light body, right? And that's Correct. the Egyptian yes. term. So it's universal for sure. And there's also evidence to suggest that the Indus civilization had a lot of Egyptian influence. And, you know, that was the beginning of what eventually became also Buddhism, you know, and the teachings from there too. Yeah, that's why I liked, I call it playing tic-tac-toe. I'm always crossing between the Egyptian, the Christian and the Tibetan, mm -hmm. because it seems like that continuity, especially the Gnostic Christian, because they, they have a through line and a thread that goes through all three and it, it, sometimes it's easier to access the other two uh, via the third. Can you explain what Gnosticism is? Because I've actually been trying to research it myself and I can't really get any consensus on it. Can you maybe well, summarize it? Uh, yeah, uh, Gnosis means knowledge. And it, the, to be a Gnostic means you are a, a seeker of knowledge. And it's often referred to uh, in sp specifically the first Christians who uh, in the time uh, from 100 to 400 AD were living mostly in Egypt and in Turkey uh, and were formulating uh, the, the original precepts of Christianity, which they, they were again labeled as the Gnostics, the awakened ones, the illumined ones. And then their, their teachings were lost for, for quite a long time and, and went underground. Okay. So we have and by the way, the, the root of Gnosis, when you track it down, the GN of Gnosis goes all the way back to the Anunnaki and it means to be radiant luminous and rainbow colored. Mm, interesting. Wow. Yeah. All right, here's, a, here's one question. 
the last one. I heard Pharaoh Onis used the pyramid to travel to Orion. Is that true? I, that's certainly a possibility. That is, Orion is always mentioned as a target um, for those on the ascension path as they're as they're making that that transition through the portal. So it's often thought of as the first portal, and then you can hang a left and head for the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And then one last question for me: What do you feel people can do now to accelerate their ascension and their rainbow light body? in our daily lives right now. I know it could be an expansive subject that would take a whole other program, but do you have yeah, any- Neil, Neil and I, we've, we've, we've got several offerings on the Portal to Ascension site. My Rainbow Light Body webinars from going back a number of years uh, really lay it out uh, quite, uh, quite, I hope concisely, and at least get you into it and, and familiar with the concept. So I'll, I'm gonna ask, say, hey, uh, check out the, my Rainbow Light Body webinars on Portal to Ascension. Beautiful. William, thank you so much, brother. Appreciate you thank always you for guys. showing up and being so yeah. amazing. And uh, just to let everybody know, we've just solidified a date in August for William's next webinar. And probably within a week or two, we'll release it and let everybody know about that. Yeah, really looking forward to that. And thank you, Neil, for, for hosting that again. Thank you, brother. Right, take care. You as well. All best blessings, everyone. Absolutely. William's uh, website is...